Hello and welcome to this video on information bias and its subtypes. This video is a part of our series on epidemiology and biostats. My name is Dr. Wahab Fazal and let us get into it. So what is information bias? I want you to think of information bias is that during the process of the study, if there is inaccuracy at almost every point, that is in fact information bias. And that's different from my video on selection bias. I'll put the link here if you want to watch that. Watch that before and then we'll get to information bias. So what is information bias? Information bias is when you do incorrect measurement, reporting or interpretation of data. At any of these points, if you're doing something wrong, that is information bias. And let us talk about its various subtypes. So in this video, I've made this beautiful chart for you to understand all six examples of information bias. And the first example that we're going to talk about is Yes, of course, it's going to be measurement bias. And can you think intuitively what could be the problem in measurement bias? So for every type of bias, I'll take two examples. I'll take one example and then I'll put the definition for you. And then the third example is basically going to hit hard that concept to basically for you to remember what we talked about. So the first example is you want to measure the weight of newborn babies. And you use a 20 year old uncalibrated scale. What's the problem? If you're using, if you're trying to measure the weight of somebody and you use a scale that does not work very well, what would be the problem? You'll get false readings. You'll get false readings. So that's the problem with this study. You're using an uncalibrated scale. You're measuring the weight of the newborn babies wrong. That's measurement bias. So what is measurement bias? Faulty measurement of the exposure or outcome is basically measurement bias. So let us take the second example. This is slightly more complicated and it's there for a reason, right? So you want to know the depression symptoms in a hospital. So what do you usually use to check for depression symptoms? We use something called the PHQ-2 or the PHQ-9 scale. So this is like a questionnaire which is well validated, very well used, translated into multiple languages and all over the world it's being used, right? But you use a self-made questionnaire. Now, the problem is not with the self-made questionnaire. The problem is with the quality of self-made questionnaire, whether that questionnaire is validated by someone who is an authority on depression and psychiatric symptoms or not. So you used a self-made questionnaire. Now that is problematic. That tool needs to be validated and you are maybe introducing something called the measurement bias because the tool that you're using to measure depression symptoms might be in fact wrong or bad. So let us look at our information bias chart again. So we talked about measurement bias. So the tool that you used was wrong. And I don't think we need a mnemonic to remember measurement bias because you're basically using the wrong tool and you're making false measurements. So the second thing is slightly more complicated. It's something called procedure bias. And we're gonna do the same thing. We'll, we'll take one example, then I'll define the bias for you. And you will also, under, when, when we understand the example, you'll also understand what is in fact procedure bias. Uh, then you won't even need the definition. And then the second example to hit hard that concept that we just studied. So the first example, a pharma company is introducing a new drug called X. In the phase three of drug testing, if you have watched my video on the clinical trial phases, then you know what are the different phases. And then you might also know the mnemonic that I used and what happens in the phase three of drug testing. It compares the drug against the standard treatment of Y. That is the standard treatment. So how are they, how are they comparing this? So basically, drug X adherence, adherence means if the people are taking it or not, is checked in the clinic. And drug Y patients are just given a bottle of pills to carry home. So there is a, so if you understand, there's like a discordance between some people are being treated differently and one group is being treated differently. So this group, which is our experimental intervention group, is being treated and their adherence, whether they're taking the medication or not, is checked regularly in the clinic. Yeah, they come back after a week and we'll check if you're taking the medication or not. And the standard treatment, for example, if you're, if drug X is something that uh, wants to check if uh, there is something improved, then acetaminophen, and this is some new drug is trying to compare something to acetaminophen, you're asking people to carry acetaminophen home, paracetamol home, and you're giving the medication that you're trying in the clinic and you're checking regularly if they're taking the medication or not. So there's this discordance. This is procedure wise. When you're introducing, when you're introducing a difference in which you treat the two groups, that is procedure wise. So incorrect method to compare the control and the intervention group or basically treating the intervention and control groups 
differently. Simply put, that is procedure bias because that is basically the entire procedure of the study. You're comparing the two things, but if you're comparing them wrong, if you're treating them wrong, that means you're introducing something called the procedure bias. Now let us take the second example to understand procedure bias even better. So a study is trying to compare the effectiveness of mental health therapy A and B for anxiety. So they're trying, they're trying these out, uh, both of these therapies for anxiety. So therapy A is done in a very quiet, office, calm, peaceful environment. And therapy B is done near a subway. Therapy B is done near a subway with a lot of distractions, with a lot of noise. Obviously, patients will be a lot more calm in the therapy A environment, which is done in a very quiet, peaceful, zen environment. And therapy B is done with a lot of noise in the background. Obviously, what will be the results of the study? Therapy A results in a much more decrease, much more decreased anxiety levels. That is the problem, inherent problem in which you conducted the study itself, the procedure of the entire study, the procedure by which you were comparing the control and intervention with each other was entirely wrong. So let us look at an information bias chart again. So we talked about measurement bias, the tool, faulty tool, bad measurement, procedure bias, faulty comparison, they're being treated differently. And then the third type, which is recall bias. You might have heard about recall bias in my previous video on the different types of studies. So let's talk about recall bias. Let's take an example once again. A study is being uh, done to compare smoking and lung cancer, right? You choose your sample from lung cancer patients. So how you're doing this study is basically in a case control fashion. If you don't know what is a case control study, watch my previous video. So, so you choose your sample from lung cancer patients. All the cases remember smoking exposure. All the cases remember smoking exposure. Meaning all the cases, if you ask any lung cancer patient and you go up to them and you ask them if they smoked or not, the odds of them remembering if they smoked are very, very high. They'll even remember, you know that one time 15 years ago, I did actually smoke a cigarette. Now I remember. And the controls, people who don't have lung cancer, a lot of them just say, no, we didn't smoke a cancer. We didn't smoke a single cigarette. Basically, this might even be true. This, this is directly because we know, we know that smoking is linked to lung cancer. But there is a problem. If you have the disease, if you ask someone who has the bad outcome, if they were exposed to the bad thing or not, they almost always say yes. A lot of them say yes. That is the problem with recall bias in case control studies. People with negative outcomes remember the exposure way better. People with lung cancer, if you ask them if they smoked or not, they say, yes, I smoked that one cigarette 25 years ago. People with, let's say, uh, diabetes, if you ask them uh, if they ate a lot of sugar or not, and they'll say, yes, I ate a lot of sugar. Even, even though the diabetes might be genetic in their family, it might be hereditary, it might be traveling down their family tree. But people with negative, uh, people with the disease remember the bad thing that they once did maybe. So that's the problem. People with negative outcomes recall their bad exposure and hence recall bias is self-explanatory. Let's try to understand the same thing with another example. We want to do a study for meat consumption and the incidence of colorectal cancer. So what you do, you do the same thing. You do a case control study. You ask people, you choose your sample from colon cancer patients. These are your cases, right? So these are your cases and you ask them if they had a lot of meat consumption or not. Most colon cancer remember eating a lot of meat. This might be true, but you have to understand that there is recall bias at play here. They have developed colon cancer. They already have the negative outcome. The odds of them remembering the bad exposure is very high and you're introducing something called recall bias. And you have to validate that in some way. You have to check their meat consumption in their life somehow. Most controls don't remember eating a lot of meat. This might be, so basically what, what I mean by this is that the odds of cases remembering, in this is like relative to, controls remembering relative to the cases is very, very low. All the cases remember eating meat. The controls are like, maybe, okay, sure, maybe, maybe we did, maybe we did smoke a cigarette somehow, maybe we did, I don't know, I'm not so sure. So we, we talked about three types of biases so far. So we talked about, we talked about measurement bias, procedure bias, and recall bias. What was recall bias? People with negative outcomes remember the bad exposure really well. 
Then let's talk about something called reporting bias. Now this is very simple. This is actually very simple. Then and all of these names. The thing with biases is uh, that all of the names are usually self-explanatory. So what would be the problem with reporting bias? Basically, you're reporting something wrong. Let's try to understand that with the help of an example again. A pharma company conducts ten trials for a new drug. They're testing out a new drug. Only three trials show positive result. Only three trials show positive result. The rest of the seven don't show anything or negative outcomes or they don't show any improvement. So what the pharma company does is they don't report the seven negative ones. They only report the three positive ones. They only report the trials in which their drug was working. They don't report the seven negative ones. This is reporting bias. This is reporting bias. Now reporting bias, if you know, has multiple subtypes and the only type that we're going to talk about is basically also called publication bias. So this might also be sometimes tested in your questions. They, they might write instead of reporting bias, publication bias because some people want to write this as publication bias. So I want you also to also remember publication bias. So what is the definition of reporting bias? When you present a skewed, basically a skewed, you want to skew the data in your own favor or incomplete picture of the outcome because you have some sort of motivation in the background, right? Also remember publication bias. Sometimes they use this name. Now let us try to understand this concept again. Let's hit this hard uh, concept basically with another example. A study is conducted to get the side effect profile of a drug called Hartilive. So they're, they're trying to make this new medication called Hartilive. One of the side effects is depression or suicidal ideation. One of this, this is a very, very bad side effect. And in fact, you need to really, really report this because if this is a side effect, then you sh this could be like a black box warning. If, if your drug is making somehow patients to suicidal ideation, making patients prone to suicidal ideation, that's a bad drug, right? So this side effect is not mentioned in the published paper. Why is that? Because the study was sponsored by the pharma company. What is this? This is reporting bias. Basically, you're presenting the incomplete picture to skew the data in your favor. This is reporting bias. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Reporting bias, the word itself is self-explanatory. So, so far, we have talked about measurement bias in which you talk about faulty tool, procedure bias in which you compared the things wrong, you dealt with one group differently and the other group differently, recall bias, people with bad, bad diseases, remember, taking or basically using bad, bad things because they're just prone to remembering that. Reporting bias, you report wrongly. The next thing that we're going to talk about is called surveillance bias. Surveillance. What is surveillance bias? Again, most of these names are self-explanatory. So let's take an example. You want to study the incidence of prostate cancer between two communities, right? One is a fancy, well-developed part of town, while the other has poor living condition, while the other is poor living condition. You want to study the incidence that does this population get prostate cancer more or does this population get prostate cancer more? So we compare the incidence between the two areas. The wealthy community has a higher incidence of prostate cancer. Now the problem with this is that the wealthy community has a very well developed healthcare infrastructure. They are going to doctors regularly. They are going to their primary care doctors regularly. They are going. They have these hospitals and they uh, they take a lot of screening tests. But the poor community does not have that many uh, health uh, health facilities or health infrastructure. So the wealthy community is being screened more for prostate cancer. The poor community is not being screened as well. They are being surveilled. The wealthy community is being surveilled for the outcome. The poor community is not being surveilled. And that might in fact explain the difference between the, the incidence of prostate cancer being high in the wealthy community. That is surveillance bias. What is surveillance bias? Basically increased monitoring for the results in one group can skew the results. Basically, if you are monitoring one group more, obviously you might find that cancer lying somewhere hidden in the body because you're doing CT scans again and again. So let's try to understand this with the help of another example. Incidence of muscle injuries between club football and county football. So club football has a lot of money, county football not so much. So the club footballs have a football players have a full health team. Each player has its own personal coach, personal health coach. They're looking into every aspect of the of the person's life, of the player's life. And the county footballers have no doctors. They just do this for fun. 
The study notes a much higher incidence of muscle injuries in club players, even though they both of these players, um, uh, both of the players in these two uh, club and counties play the same amount of football. What is the problem? Well, they have a full, the club players have a full health team that do regular health checkups and that might in fact explain the higher incidence of muscle injuries in club players and we have to take that into account. That is surveillance bias. When you surveil one group more than the other, you introduce surveillance bias. So let us look at this chart once again. So we talked about all of these. If you remember reporting bias, you're reporting the res results differently. You're basically uh, putting things incomplete because you want to make, you have certain motive behind the reporting of your data incomplete. And then surveillance bias, you're surveilling or you're screening one group more than the other. So all of these, if you, if you notice a pattern, all of these things are very self-explanatory. Their names are very self-explanatory of which the bias is basically. But this last thing is slightly different. And you will say that Hawthorne bias Wahab does not, is not, is not that self-explanatory. The name is very different. And I will make that very easy for you. So the name Hawthorne effect might look very complicated, but I think I can even explain Hawthorne effect with very one very simple example and one mnemonic from which you will remember this whole thing very simply and very easily. So what is that mnemonic? That mnemonic is how I'm being observed. How I'm being observed. Basically, just remember that and you will know that if you want to do, let's take the example, we want to do a study if family medicine docs are asking mental health questions or not, right? We want to do a study on this. The docs notice that the researcher is moving around the clinic. Basically, the docs are noticing that there is this new guy in the clinic who's, uh, who's seeing, who's checking if I'm asking mental health questions or not, if I'm screening patients for mental health problems or not. What will happen? Obviously, the doctors will change their behavior. Why? Because they may be worried about their jobs. They may be worried about being, or maybe they're just worried about being observed by someone in the clinic if they're doing their job well or not. And that is the problem with Hawthorne effect. When somebody knows that they're being observed, when somebody knows how I'm being observed, they change their behavior. That is Hawthorne effect. What will be the results of this study? 100% of the doctors ask mental health questions. Now, if you have ever worked in a mental in a family medicine clinic, you know that this is not always true in the case of all the patients. This is, might not always be possible in the case of all, all the patients because the doctors know the patients really well sometimes and they don't have to ask these questions all the time. They should, but they don't have to ask these questions all the time. But what happened to the results of this particular study? The doctors noticed that somebody was in the clinic and observing them see if, to see if they're asking the patient these questions or not and they changed their behavior. And that is in fact Hawthorne effect. When the participants change their behavior when they're being observed, how I'm being observed. I don't think we need another example to understand Hawthorne effect. So now let us summarize the whole thing. So measurement bias, you used a faulty tool. Procedure bias, you used a faulty method of comparison. Basically, you treated the intervention group and the control groups very differently. Hence your entire procedure of conducting the study was wrong. Recall bias, people who, who have developed the negative outcomes remember the negative exposure really well. Reporting bias, presenting when you present an incomplete or skewed picture of the results, you don't present the whole data or you basically present the data differently to make some sort of, to make some sort of a point. Surveillance bias, if you screen some people more, the odds of you finding a disease in those particular group is very high. That, that leads to increased perceived incidence, increased incidence, as compared to the control, of course. Uh, Hawthorne effect, being observed causes a change in behavior, how I'm being observed. And that is all you need to know about information bias and its subtypes. Thank you so much for watching this video. As, as always, all good things take time and so does this video. If you like this video, go watch my series on epidemiology and biostats and subscribe to my channel.